Imagine a quantum state that's more than just a number or a simple vector. It's a unique spinner holding the secrets of specific measurement outcomes. Join us as we uncover the significance of eigenspinners in quantum mechanics and their pivotal role in understanding spin measurements. In today's problem, what we're tasked with is a three-part beast, where in part A we want to find the eigenvalues and eigenspinners, really eigenvectors but in this spinner notation or spinner context, of the spin y matrix. Part B, if you measure it, uh, the matrix SY on a particle in the general state chi, what values might you get and what are the probabilities of each? Check that the probabilities add to one. Part C. If you measure the S squared, what values might you get and with what probabilities? As you see, we're going to see a lot of these things. Again, the S squares, I think you already have an insight onto what that will be based on previous problems. But trust me, by the end of this video, you'll have a newfound appreciation for the elegance and the complexity of quantum mechanics. They do go hand in hand. Before we start, I'd like to mention that there's a free companion PDF available for you to follow along. You can access it using the link below. That has a little more of the nitty gritty in it, but definitely can be helpful. Let's dive into this question. All right, so stop number one, if we want to find what these eigenvalues are, we need to use the characteristic equation. If you've been through a linear algebra class, this is nothing new, and we could see it being used pretty quick. However, we need to write the SY matrix not in terms of a factored form here, but in terms of a square matrix that we can then take the determinant of. So go ahead and distribute the H bar over two into the matrix. This was the poly matrix uh, sigma Y. So we just uh, collapse, or not collapse it, but uh, put it all together here, and then we use the characteristic equation to solve for lambda. Uh, we know that we have to multiply lambda by i, and we see that when we take the difference because of these zeros here, we get a minus lambda and minus lambda. If we evaluate this determinant, we get lambda squared because the two negatives cancel, and we get a lambda squared. The i's here will lead to a minus sign after everything's done, and we see that we get lambda squared equals uh, h bar over 2 squared as well, and thus we had a plus and a minus for our two eigenvalues. This, of course, should come as no surprise. We saw in the algebraic theory that we can level up by h bar over 2 in increments of such and integer increments. So everything is coming out well, and we're good to go there. But we're not done with this realm yet. We still have a lot to do for the eigenspinners, but we know that we checked off one of our points in finding the eigenvalues. Moving on to the eigenspinners, this is going to take a lot more work, so this is where I would say reference the PDF, but let's dive in. What we see here in the second stop is that in order to solve for this, we have to go back to that characteristic equation, but instead of a determinant, what we have to do is solve this as a system of equations, because that's what it represents. Except this time, we have to plug in the specific value of lambda 1 and lambda 2 for each of the system states. Um, and this is what the eigenvector will represent for this measurement. That being said, we saw that uh, the lambdas all had an h bar over 2 in them, so we could factor that out from the S matrix and keep it nice and compact here. We were told that the chi's were that of a, um, excuse me, that we had a, uh, a general state that we need to solve for. Um, so we just generalize this for each or each eigenvalue. So I just use alpha 1, alpha, and then beta 1 for the two different elements there. You can use x1, x2, it doesn't matter. What does matter is that you stay consistent and make sure that one eigenvalue stays with one set, one stays with the other. And that's what the color code does here. And then you'll see that when we plug in lambda here because it's double negative, we just get a positive there. So again, a little more clean in the PDF, but you get the gist of it here. This is a zero vector, so we just put zeros for the two uh, entries that we need to make this system complete, and then we solve it. You can solve this system of equation however you deem fit. I find it easiest to use gauss jordan elimination, and that sets us up with a, uh, or reduced row echelon form, which can be obtained from gauss jordan Whatever method you like, use it. There is a fantastic tool online called matrixcalc.org. 
use it all the time. It helps save you a lot of uh, tedious work and helps you in case you make a mistake. Definitely, definitely check that out because I find it very useful. Um, but one thing to observe here is that when we get it into this reduced form, we see that we still need to multiply these out. And when we do so, if you're not used to linear algebra, ideally we want things on the main diagonal that we have a one-to-one -one ratio or one-to-one -one, uh, variable to uh, coefficient um, relation. That way we could solve for the variable ex uh, ex exclusively. But um, that way we could solve for that particular variable without any worry. However, this is going to be a problem, so let's check that out. What we see here is that when we multiply those matrices out, we get a alpha 1 uh, and then plus i beta 1. And so if we, and that equals 0, of course, due to the right-hand side. So what we end up having is a relationship that uh, relates alpha 1 and beta 1 and then alpha 2 and beta 2 together. This means that we have a free variable. We were not able to reduce and eliminate all the variables uh, in a nice and nice succinct way to where we had a one coefficient to one variable and that equals zero so we can't rule out anything so we'll have to deal with that in a little while but what we can do is use this relationship to find out a substitution once we do that we see here that this happens in both cases of course and we can plug this back into our form of the vector where beta 1 takes on this beta 2 takes on this and we could factor out alpha 1 and alpha 2 respectively and we see that these are the heart of the eigenvectors, and in this context, they're eigenspinners. What we call alpha is a free variable because we don't have any other information to eliminate that or otherwise solve it until we realize we're dealing in quantum mechanics and we could use our old reliable friend. Let's check that out. We know that we, in quantum mechanics, have to be normalized. So, what we do is normalize in order to solve for alpha 1, which we do here. Take the inner product again with the matrices, and we see that we get alpha 1 magnitude, and then the second entry magnitude squared as well, all has to equal 1. After the arithmetic, you see that 1 equals 2 alpha 1, so we can solve that down here, and we get that famous 1 over square root 2 that we've seen so many times and will continue to see. Similarly, same normalization on the alpha 2. What this allows us to do now is find the normalized eigenvector. So we get all that done pretty quick. And we see that when we adapt it to our uh, notation for the Dirac notation, which will definitely be helpful in part B, we see that we get our normalized eigenvectors, eigenspinners here as such. Be careful because we can't assume that these values are real. As you see, they can be complex, and this will be emphasized again in the probabilities. So, without further ado, let's jump to part B. Oh, well, yep, our checkpoints. We definitely got through the eigen, uh, vec or eigenvalues. Those are really easy to do. It's these that take a little more work. Not every time when we solve for them do we have a free uh, variable, so be aware sometimes as you get into bigger systems like three by three you can have up to two free variables sometimes three if the system is not well defined and all those other things from linear algebra this is why i harp on if you can take a linear algebra course before you get into quantum mechanics it'll save you on these inevitable headaches moving forward then we get to stop number three which is for part b now again these spin matrices work in particular because we're dealing in spin one half particle systems and if we want for a generalized or general normalized state chi we have a and b put it in Dirac notation but again since we want a general state that's normalized we see that this relation has to hold okay not too bad i think we've seen that before however if we recall what we saw with the coefficients and the functions and how they relate what we were really trying to show is that we want in terms of probabilities the projection of this eigenspinner on the general state so that's why we have this inner product here and of course we divide by this which is done just out of pure um ease of generalization and this is used in many other texts i reference zettily in the pdf uh, we use a lot of these just because it makes it easy regardless of what we're given this is just a normalization factor. 
So if we're not normalized, now we are. That being said, what this Dirac notation represents again is the dagger and the chi need to be multiplied. The dagger again representing the conjugate transpose, which we'll see from here after we plug in the eigenspinner and the general state. Of course, the one over square root of two, it's just a number, kick it outside the magnitude, it's real. You can square that and be good to go. Here is the conjugate transpose though, just be aware it's not just a transpose, it's not just a conjugate, it's both. And that will come up in the other case as well. So let's go ahead and make this uh, multiplication and simplify. All right, cool. So with that, what we see is that we have, after we multiply and simplify, that we get a minus ib squared, in the magnitude, of course. We want the modulus. That being said, this, if it was just a complex number, would be z times z star. So we take this whole argument, the entry itself, and the complex conjugate. And of course, it would be hard to compare, so we're doing a little more work now, that way we can compare for the second part of part b, to make sure that they actually equal one when added. The probabilities that is so just go ahead and distribute that after you take the complex conjugate and this is what we end up to not too bad now that we've kind of seen the form of it we'll run through uh, for eigenvalue 2 and we just get the same kind of result instead of a minus ib we get a plus ib so that makes sense because one is a plus one is a minus that all makes sense now let's go ahead and or yeah let's go ahead and compile these all we see that this is the uh, factored form, or FOIL distributed form, not factored form. But what we can say for the sake of answering the question of what are the probabilities, these are the probabilities. That's not too bad. What we want to verify though, especially since we're dealing in, complex, in the complex world, we want to verify that the probabilities do sum to one. So what we need to do is use the uh, distributed form of these probabilities and verify the statement. Let's go ahead and jump into that, and it'll be pretty quick with, since we already did the algebra here. Okay. So, yep, we got all that fun stuff done. Uh, probabilities, as you see, is checked off. Let's dive into ver verifying. Oops. Dive into verifying. Yep. All right. So here, just add them together. Let's see if they actually equal one. We see both of them have a one-half term, so we could factor that out. Um, it might behoove us, as you see, to highlight the fact that this is a negative and this is a positive on the green on the green terms because we have an AB star and AB star minus BA star and then a plus BA star. So what we want to do is factor a negative out, but in doing so we have to make this minus sign a negative. And then you see we get compatible forms after we factor and push together these two bracket terms and the imaginary parts actually cancel. Who would have thought? Pretty clever. Now what we see is that we get a magnitude a squared and a magnitude a squared, so we have two of them. We also have two magnitude b squareds, so we could factor out a two. What do you know? We get a cancellation with the one half. So what we end up with is magnitude a squared plus magnitude b squared. Does that equal one? Well, if you recall, this was a general state that was normalized, so we get back the normalization condition. So yes, they do sum to one. That is pretty cool, and what a great check. Not too bad, definitely expected, but sometimes it's good just to see the things written out for the sake of clarity. Okay, so then moving to stop number four and part C, we get to our final stop, but we're not gonna have to spend much time here because we've seen this before. When we square the SY matrix, all we end up doing is end up with the poly matrix squared and the uh, coefficient here squared. But we saw that the poly matrix squared was just the identity matrix. So if we distribute in the squares here, and then we put this into the characteristic equation for the eigenvalues, we very quickly see that the eigenvalue and the only eigenvalue that exists due to the square being on the outside here is lambda equal h bar squared over four, which we knew from before with the expectation values when we were tinkering with that in the last two questions. But because this is the only eigenvalue that exists, we know that the probability of this thing being measured is one or a hundred percent. That's pretty good to know and pretty weird considering how uh, crazy the rest of quantum mechanics is. But when we square it, we're guaranteed to get this measurement. Pretty cool, I'd say. Not bad at all.
finally we get to the end of this journey well this was a rather quick journey regardless of my rambling from this video you now see how the eigenvalues and eigenvectors play together what their roles are in determining probabilities and this allows for a little more systematic uh, way of approximating or not approximating but finding values and systematizing quantum mechanics systems and all the other fun stuff of course we saw with the s squared we've dealt with that before much much uh, easier to deal with the squares in this case unlike the momentum that we saw starting off this book pretty cool though again i must say thank you to the patrons who support this channel it is definitely helping right now because there's a lot to cover work is still being crazy but here we are having fun being curious um, if you'd like to support please feel free to check out patreon or share this curiosity because this is what allows uh, me and a couple friends to keep this going it is a lot of fun and of course this is just the beginning so with that i will see you at the next one but stay curious because it is a lot of fun